Hello and welcome back to Refinitive Perspectives Live. This is our eighth episode and we will be talking about transformation of technology with our guests from Dubai and from Hong Kong. First, we have Helene Lee, co-founder of Go Impact, and also Mark Esposito, co-founder and chief learning officer as at Nexus Frontier Deck Tech. Welcome to both of you. It's really yeah. nice to have you from Dubai joining and from Hong Kong joining. We made it super international. Um, thanks to, to our colleagues who organized all this. So thanks for joining. It's a um, really, really special event throughout the 24 hour uh, day that we have planned. I'm going to start with the first uh, question that um, most of you probably can answer. In terms of transformation of technology, has the technology spectrum changed that dramatically from, let's say, January 2020 to January 2021? Maybe, uh, Helene, you can start. Sure. Thank you, thank you, Shahad. And really nice to be here. And I really look forward to this one with Mark. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's sort of like a, a bit of a dream team coming together from around the world. So, you know, kudos to the Refinitiv team for putting this together. I think COVID really has been both a dream and a nightmare. You know, it's a nightmare for the whole world, definitely. There's the tragic losses and all that. But the dream of digital transformation or accelerating that has really been pushed so much faster. It's the biggest accelerator and disruptor uh, in the digital space. So all of a sudden, the whole world is moved to, you know, kind of... Um, remote working and even in finance industry where I come from where is this probably you know a, a lot more regulated as well as slower uh, to actually make a lot of those fundamental systemic changes we find suddenly that we have got regulators working together with the financial institutions to try to implement really pretty systemic changes uh, to the way in which you know it, it operates so I really think a lot of the technology that we've been seeing in fintech, such as AI, biometrics, blockchain, and so on, are really put to the stress test in terms of real life adoption. Let me just stop there because I think Mark has a lot to share uh, on that as well. But I think it's both a dream and a nightmare and we're seeing that massive adoption of technology that we've been reading and seeing all over the place really coming to life uh, between 2020 and, and now. Well, first of all, great to be here. Thanks for the intro, Sahad, and good to talk to you. Len. We've been on multiple rambles between Twitter and LinkedIn and now here. <laughs> so definitely, uh, this is a, a great space to be right now. The conversation on, on technology 2020, 2021, uh, from the perspective of my firm, which is an AI company, of course, we have seen an increase of business because now there was much more normalization on the idea of artificial intelligence. If before it would take us multiple meetings for client with clients to understand together whether AI was the right answer. Today, AI is a much more accepted norm. And I think the same can be said for some degree of automation where automation was uh, uh, compensating and subsidizing the absence of physical activities during the lockdown. I think, though, uh, the cost of technology in some part has become cheaper, which I think is something that we should consider. In other part, has not become cheaper. And so technology equally has become a form of discrimination between companies who can afford it and those who cannot really afford it. And if before, this was much more of a blurred space where you can see there is some nuances. Right now, it's a clear cut. The company that simply cannot afford it and therefore they're maybe resorting to open innovation and company they are going into bespoke solutions much more integrated. I think that's the main difference. On a final note, I think sustainability out of this um, through technology has become also a bit of a big winner in this case. Uh, if before we're thinking about using technology to accelerate SDGs, um, I guess today we know that technology can really help us. So this is where maybe the upside of this conversation is that we have equally accelerated the relationship between technology and sustainability. Back to you, Sean. Thank you. Um, I mean, when we're talking about the winners, um, we've also interviewed you in back in Davos in a meeting in January 2020 um, about the role of ESG in the rising prospects of the financial investments and, of course, beyond. So, if we asked you the same question today. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say? 
You know, I would say that if uh, in uh, January 2020, ESG was profiling itself to be um, a mainstream conversation at the forum, uh, today is even more than before. Uh, the number of investors who are now scouting and looking for ESG uh, metrics, accountability and opportunity, I think is increasing more and more. Um, we think that sustainability has finally became become uh, a business case for many companies. While before, I guess, company had a lip service that would tell you, yes, we do that, but they were really in the backstage hardly finding how can they make it happen. And today, I guess, the pressure from an investor that would not necessarily invest otherwise is rapidly changing their value chain. And to me, I think 2020, like Helen said before, has been one of the major accelerants. Um, not necessarily everything was good, but in some dimension, the eco chambers have been actually quite good. Um, I mean, also, um, Helen, maybe you can also, I mean, Obviously, you're you're in, in that field uh, as well. But uh, you've also mentioned um, that sustainability in general has been moved center stage. Maybe you can also attach sure. to that. Sure, absolutely. I think uh, there are two things, two shifts that we see. To echo Mark's point, uh, it's no longer a nice to have, but a must have uh, sustainability, and it's no longer a by the way but um, a kind of fast becoming mainstream. I don't think we're quite there yet, exactly. I Because I see a few gaps, but at least um, the kind of um, marketing agenda, uh, agenda to becoming a business and investment agenda. And I think... Yes, okay. uh, we uh, we lost a lamp for time being shot. Yeah, move this no, I, I, ahead. So I, let me I, just give one example here of the fact that the inflows into ETFs that have an ESG has outpaced the past four years in 2020. Uh, but still, we are not seeing the same amount into active investments, for instance. So it's not the same across all the different asset classes. It's more into the passive investments like ETFs. I think there is going to be a more major shift towards more asset classes having um, that, and the whole standardization uh, discussion. Whether we have, you know, a kind of global standard in terms of sustainability disclosure, I think will be key to moving this forward for investors, for mainstream investors and institutional investors. Yeah, you mentioned the gap that is still existing, right? We lost you for a mm. second. That's why. Okay, perfect. Um, I mean, Mark, you wanted to, to add something uh, to, to that. I don't want to interrupt before I go into the next question. Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, Shahad, what I, I resonate together with Helene on this is that um, before sustainability was driven by mainly social activists, the policymakers, but we really could not get the financial industry on board. It uh, simply was difficult for us to see that they were stepping up. Uh, I guess... Today, uh, largest part of the sustainability agenda are pushed by the financial players. And we know that when finance, policy and technology get together, uh, great advances really happen. And, and I, I see this as to be really that, that acceleration that will take us to a few years down the line. Uh, it would have taken us much longer to get where we really are right now. And I feel it also within my own industry that um, the ESG business and how do you apply artificial intelligence to ESG measurement is becoming an increasing amount of, of uh, priority. So it looks like that even if we have not discussed before this, uh, the stars are really aligning in that direction. Yeah, if I could just echo on that point, Mark, because um, I think also the public and private sectors are really aligning on this as well. I see a lot of momentum from stock exchanges, for instance, in Asia Pacific and even in Middle East, where, where you are based. Um, they yeah. really are pushing the disclosure around sustainability beyond just one annual report that you can outsource to a consultant of sorts. So there is a real move to try to steer this into the more uh, actionable um, area for investors. So that's a good thing. The other thing is, of course, recently the IFRS, um, uh, you know, the, the Global um, you know, uh, Accounting Standards uh, Report, Standardization Board, is asking for uh, consultation on establishing uh, benchmarks globally uh, in terms of sustainability disclosure. So all these, I think, are stars aligning uh, to move the agenda forward 
into really a business and investment agenda beyond the social activists, beyond the do good, uh, beyond uh, CSR, I got a budget to spend. It really is fast becoming and it needs to uh, becoming a business and investment agenda in order to meet the 2030 timeline of achieving the SDGs. Yeah, it's becoming the new the new normal, more or less, let's say. Everyone's talking about the technology and how it's been developing, but also in terms of ESG, sustainability itself, in so many other sectors, it's the same thing. They're all changing the direction of that being the new normal, sustainability being one of the main reasons to, to take one or the other decision also, mm -hmm. if it's sustainable yep. or not. So it's really, really nice to see that it's been developing more or less because of COVID and because of the whole change uh, into that direction, which is really nice. If I can share, Shahad, just an interesting yes. uh, research that I came across. Um, you know, if we had not necessarily accelerated, uh, we would have reached the SDG by 2072 from a study that I read, which means that if you're looking at the, the ambition that we had prior to COVID, no matter how much we would have really managed. Of course, Scandinavia would have reached there, we've been there, but large yeah. populous countries where you are really want to see the shifting of the needle would have not gotten there. I think today the estimate is that if we're able to integrate technology in the pursuit of, of uh, SDG, we might have a chance in getting that to by 2030, but that implies a significant different movement than the one we had prior to COVID which shows you that the first five years were very programmatic and very much of an architecture of the idea, but not very, very easy to become actionable. And I think what Helen said before, the actionability today is something that nobody argued, discussed, because if we could not action, we would not really exist anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I have, um, yes, sorry, please, just Helen. To echo, yeah, just to echo that point, you know, uh, by 2070, that's really alarming, Mark. It's sort of like, you know, would we, would we yeah. exist the way we, you know, we do now? But, you know, it again echoes that 2.3 uh, trillion funding gap annually uh, in order to achieve it by 2030. And this again shows that the public private kind of collaboration and to move this further and faster ahead is very much needed. Well, yeah, I have another question because um, what has been, um, well, in the mouth of everyone more or less in the last past weeks is data, privacy, censorship. They have been on the global stage in the past two weeks in so many different um, areas uh, that have been, you know, discussed the subject. Is this, would you say, just an epic or episodic perfect storm or do you see this trend from before, and, and if so, where is it heading, in your opinion? I can give you a first step on this, uh, Shahad. Um, yes. You know, I, I've been studying myself, uh, you know, besides my role at Nexus, I, I'm an academic, so I, I work on research. And I've been studying the governance of technology for quite some time. The last time that we did something more uh, significant was a report for the World Economic Forum in October 19. And what do we discover is that we are dealing with the necessity to regulate, but it's so difficult to know what to regulate. Are you regulating the companies, the software, the supplier, the users, the consumers? So I think in 2020, we started to feel the dark mirror side of technology as well. I guess in the, in the early 2020, with the, the entire uh, drama of the Capitol Hill in the United States and what happened afterwards, and the Twitter impeachment of Trump, which basically means that Trump was impeached first by the technology company, then then by, by the House of Representatives. Uh, we know that the power that, that this company have is something that we should consider. So I believe the difference from before is that this will be on the table of major governments, but not only that. Uh, like it always happened, many organizations, they find a way to self-regulate. They start having standards. They start determining what is basically the organizing principle of the way we want to work. So I think the main difference from before is that the government technology today is on the agendas of both public and private to, uh, to uh, echo what Helen said before. Before was primarily in the, uh, in the agenda of think tank of research of academia but it hadn't yet fully translated into something. I guess now the conversation is much more spread out to more players. So I'm hopeful the conversation will continue to foster its normal trajectory. But I'd love to hear what Alain think about this. 
I, I fully agree with that, Mark, because I think as another byproduct of COVID is the whole cybersecurity, uh, data privacy thing have really come forefront because people are interacting so much more uh, mm -hmm. on social media, using digital tools, and even wet ink signature, which is like, a, you know, the kind of protected, you know, uh, area that banks would demand when you do KYCs or other things, you suddenly find that it's moving digital. And then with that comes a lot of um, new governance structures, um, you know, from regulators and so on around uh, data privacy, as well as cybersecurity. So I do see that, uh, and of course, a lot of reg tech solutions, uh, as well as kind of AI solutions uh, wrapped around that. I do see that as part of what drives the tech for good and sustainability as well, because unless we can actually move all in sync on all these things, uh, mm -hmm. we will have huge issues in trying to deliver on whether it be the tech agenda, the digital transformation agenda, or the sustainability agenda. What do you think can corporations do about this? This, this whole shift and um, the changes or even, you know, thinking about who's regulating who or what. What do you think uh, corporations should like do or where should they tend to, to develop? I think they are moving faster than before. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, before if you feel you can stay in a comfort zone, like, you know, I'm, I'm a big enough corporate, you know, I've got a huge balance sheet and it buys me a long runway. Suddenly, I think everybody went up to the fact that that runway could be a lot shorter uh, than you think. Um, and I think there's less resistance in terms of, oh, let's push it back. Or it's enough just to pay lip service, as Mark was, uh, you know, um, talking about. I think it, it really, they are trying to do that. But obviously, with a big organization, moving ahead uh, in a way, it's like hurting. Uh, to get all every to get all the you know uh, functions lined up and all that it's still a process uh, in the making but I believe that it's much better before uh, COVID uh, you know um, happened. Yeah, and, and to react on that, you know, the, the technology they are now creating a much more transparent form of the transactions, they go well in the direction of governance because we'll also know better what to govern. You know, I'm always uh, being an adamant believer that technology like blockchain are currently underserving our society, considering the benefit they really have. Because we have, so like we have uh, boxed them too much around just uh, financial transaction, but blockchain is really just a storage of value. It can be applied in so many different ways. I think if we're increasing the transparency, if we create a culture where transparency is not a negative connotation or red tape, I guess governing will become easier because suddenly we are going to have more elements to assess in front of us. And just one one quick comment in terms of like some time I go back and things that we already do. Like you go into a bank and bank already has a set of rules for you to engage with the bank. You can do everything you want, right? Um, we transfer capital from one location to the other by using, for example, the IBAN. That's a standard that's been accepting globally to make sure that when I'm sending $10, from Dubai, they will be $10 in, in Hong Kong. They will not become two or three, right? So how we decide the standard for international collaboration, we think of standards and time as a, as a way of preventing, but I think standards are a way of protecting the function of the industry. And I guess the question is how do we use governance and more transparency to actually protect? Because what we want to avoid is the innovation graveyard of a policy that will actually push the startup away and investors. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think what this prompted, uh, Mark, I don't know whether you agree, is that in this age, it's almost like trust is a common currency, you know, with uh, greater transparency, with greater efficiency, the need to build trust has never been stronger ever before, because it's not much you can hide anymore. And trust is really a very delicate thing that, um, you know, it, it, I think it's a really common currency in the stage going forward. You know, Helen, yeah. one thing I like to share on that, sorry to have interrupted Shahad. Um, when uh, we sometimes do classes in economics, which is what I tend to teach, I always remind them that the original inception of money was out of trust. It was the form of trust. And then it became something else over time. And when we introduced cryptocurrency with the social experiment of Bitcoin, we actually reinstated the idea that trust doesn't have to come from a central bank, but trust is what a group of people decide normally to accept. 
And so I guess what you say is absolutely on the money to actually to play with words. Uh, it's really that that trust today has to be reestablished and technology uh, can really help us in that direction. Rather than thinking technology always uh, with the fact that technology is a negative driver, it is not. It is what we collectively design it to become. Probably it's also the combination of uh, not only the technology, but the transparency and, of course, the trust that is a result from exactly that combination. Oh, so um, I have, uh, conscious of time, I have one other question because I wanna, want uh, to get an outlook from the both of you, if you can. So, I mean, you have, uh, Mark, also you have written extensively about the governance of technology and we just talked about this, which is a clear priority for 2021. But um, looking forward, where do you see this, the conversation that we also just had now taking us? Um, I mean, also that we all know how, how critical this is. Well, I, I can share from, from what I, I feel uh, that the rules of engagement will become much more upfront, Shah, than, than now. Now we sometimes hide under the disclaimer of accepting the conditions, right? But then again, we're shifting the problem to somewhere else. I think having those rules of engagement at the very beginning is a form of maturity of the industry that somehow will grow up to a role or responsibility. Because I guess one of the major takeaway for me in 2020 is that sometimes truth is not two-sided. There's only one side. Truth doesn't necessarily have multiple sides. But if you're giving a technology uh, access to anybody that has an alternative truth, suddenly you're amplifying this to what becomes then a quite dangerous, uh, you know, like a dangerous demographic movement, which is millions of people believing a story that suddenly is completely false. I mean, having rules of engagement on also defining what is of value is nothing wrong. We've been running on ethical standard for all of the time. There are things that industry do. Think of the pharma industry or think about what a doctor has to do when he sees patients or what happened in a hospital. I mean, we're, we don't have to see uh, the rules of engagement as anything that is inhibiting our ability to operate. I think it's the opposite. It's, a, it's actually a, it's boundaries that it unleashes our best potential. Without boundaries, we wouldn't be able to really unleash that. So I see this always as an opportunity. I would like to see 2021, to answer your question, Shahad, in that direction where the, the conversation doesn't become a trade-off, but more as a positive sum game. Yeah, I would echo that actually, Shahad, because uh, I'm an optimist by nature. Uh, not a naive optimist, but an optimist. And I think that side of me sees um, the whole momentum around tech as well as sustainability, pushing it to the point that what we call sustainable investments, impact investments might eventually become a redundant term in that, of course, this will be factored into the investment process. There's not a thing as a mainstream investment uh, and then another you know, side of it that is E, S and G. So perhaps what we are working together on is to make that term redundant. Hopefully. <laughs> Thanks for your for your time, for the energy and for the great, great insights. You have put it very in beautiful words for a really, really nice outlook also for us here. So thanks for your time. Uh, hopefully we're going to see you soon uh, for whatever subject and episode. So thanks for that and have a great day. Thanks, Shah. Thank thanks so for much. moderating this. It was actually great. Uh, so I look forward to the next opportunity. And I guess I'll see you on Twitter, Helen, right? Uh, in our next. <laughs> Absolutely. Episode. Absolutely, Mark. You got it. All right. Thank you so much. All the best, guys. Nice to see you Thank again. You. Take care. Well, if you joined enjoyed this episode, you can learn more about the ESG data sets by scanning the code or going to the link on the screen now. And as always, feel free to join us and be sure to stay tuned for the next episode, which is in about half an hour. So I hope to see you soon. Thank you for listening and talk to you.